Hi everyone, welcome to day two of this year's Manchester in Translation, a virtual conference which kicked off yesterday and is taking place today, tomorrow, um, today and tomorrow to celebrate International Mother Languages Day. I'm Nia, Events and Conferences Coordinator here at Comma Press. Comma are an independent publishers based in Manchester who champion the short story and works in translation. We are delighted to welcome Ari, Leila and Anton here for our first panel of the conference, uh, Queering Translation. We have some questions prepared, but also welcome questions and encourage discussion um, from all of you tuning in live. If you have any questions or thoughts throughout the talk, uh, please do pop them in the chat on your screen. The panel discussion will last around 45 minutes and after that we will select a few questions to round off the talk. Please do share and tweet about the conference using the hashtag MIT2023. And finally, if you're interested in tuning in to our second panel on translating underrepresented languages, just meet us back here on the Comma Press YouTube channel at the same time tomorrow. So thank you, Ari, Anton and Leila for joining us today. Uh, Ari Heinrich is a professor of Chinese literature and media at the ANU. They are known for their translation of queer Taiwanese novels such as Last Words from Montmartre by Chiu Minchin. Leila Benitez James is a queer translator, poet, writer and editor. They are a 2022-2023 Book Critics Circle Fellow and NEA Fellow in Translation. Anton Her is a graduate of the Korean University College of Law. Um, he works as a writer and translator and has won pen translation grants transatlantically and was double longlisted and shortlisted for the 22 International Booker Prize. That's a very brief introduction and I'm hoping over the course of the next 45 minutes or so you will learn much more about each of our guests and their practice. Uh, so the purpose of today's panel is to dig a little deeper into what a queer translation practice looks like and to find out from our panel what strategies might inform their practice with regard to translating both contemporary and historic queer literature and the ethical implications of doing so. So I'd like to kick things off by asking each of you to introduce yourselves um, by discussing a queer text you have translated recently and share one good difficulty in translating the text and one joy. So Ari, if we could start with you. Sure. Hi, everybody. And uh, thanks, Nia. And um, uh, thanks uh, for everyone for putting together this panel and the whole conference. Um, it's a pleasure. I, I have uh, my thought about a, a queer text I translated recently takes queer as a pretty broad category. Um, and it's that uh, recently I uh, I uh, wrote a literary essay that involves um, a volcano, and it also has a kind of autobiographical component. And in the essay, I describe go visiting a junk shop in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, coming stumbling across a model volcano that had little labels uh, taped to it in um, that were, I thought, written in Chinese, and they were really tiny, so I kind of had to lean in closer to have a, have a look at what they were, and I discovered, ah, oh, the reason I can't understand what they say, two, well, two reasons. One is I don't know geological vocabulary, even in English, really, uh, but also it actually was uh, Japanese, uh, written in kanji, so it was legible as Chinese, but it was actually Japanese. And so I went through this whole process of trying to figure out what is the volcano and how am I going to translate it, et cetera, et cetera. And then at some point I realized that there was a big problem. And the problem was that I was standing on um, this, the, the um, volcanic geology, because that part of Melbourne is uh, volcanic plains, uh, where indigenous peoples had been describing volcanoes for thousands and thousands of years. Um, in in many different ways. And here I was struggling to translate between imperial languages, so between Chinese, Japanese, English. Um, and I realized that if I attempted to make a translation, even in this small context, I would instantly erase thousands and thousands of years of description that were local to that place that I was just a settler on. So that was a, a weird challenge. Um, it was both a challenge and a joy at once to realize that I could just refuse, um, refuse to translate it at all. Um, and for me, that's kind of wrapped up in the experience of queerness. 
it's a refusal. It's a right to refuse uh, to participate in whatever small way um, in those kind of those power dynamics. Thank you. Uh, Leila, would you like to follow on from that? Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, I just want to echo Ari's thanks for, for organizing this panel. And like, I'm really blown away to be in such company. And I was excited to join um, partly because I love being, you know, taking part in these conversations, but also just because I have so many questions and like, it's, it really helps me formulate. Like, I feel like I'm very much at the beginning um, and thinking about a lot of these questions. Um, but for, you know, thinking about um, a queer text that I've translated recently, um, the, like, I almost wanted to start with the, the joy rather than the challenge, because um, it was this text, which is a very slim volume. Um, it's by Beatriz Miralles de, um, de Imperial, um, and the title, Oscura de la Piel Su Sombra, um, was like the most immediate challenge to translating the text. Um, but the background of, of coming to the text was one of the most joyful translation experiences um, that I've ever had because it was one of those things that just came up as a surprise of life. I had moved to, to Murcia, Spain in 2014 and the poet Bea was somebody who I had actually met um, and known first as like an art curator and an editor before I ever read her poems. And then um, just happenstance of life, we were just like friends and um, she ended up going through a breakup with a girlfriend at the same time that I did. So it was more like on a friendship level, we like, like commiserated over a breakup, um, our you know respective breakups. Um, I went on to work on translation and she went on to write this book. Um, you know, it's not really a breakup book. It gets kind of really metaphorical and, and goes different directions. But when I got the book about three years later after I'd met her, it was one of those things where it just felt really personal. I didn't think about translating the book at first. It just felt like, oh, this is such a wonderful encapsulation of what it means to break up um, and try to find yourself again. Um, and so then once I, I actually spoke with her at um, a book launch event and said, oh, it would be really wonderful to try to translate it. Um, the title was really, really tricky because the, you know, Spanish has gendered articles, but also non-specific pronouns. So in the title, you have la piel, which is the skin, um, which is gendered. And then you have su sombra, which could be his or her or their shadow. Um, so immediately, like, there's, like, the most literal translation I could get, which would be, like, um, the skin is left dark by their shadow, um, but the kind of connotations of the title, and, like, once you read the book, is, like, a speaker's skin, like, my skin is left dark by your shadow. There's a lot of, like, the second person used, um, and so there were so like instantly I had kind of like 10 combinations that I could use, but then also personally knowing the background of where the book came from, like I know that this is, um, you know, a female poet talking about um, a female lover. And so in Spanish, the title um, doesn't need to be gendered. You don't need to know who was missing who. Um, but um, and luckily I had the poet to talk to, like I made a, a draft of the text and then I could actually just ask Bea, you know, like this is how it is in Spanish. This is how it could be in English. Like, what do you prefer? Do you have any sort of like background intentions, which I, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do if the, if the author was no longer living. Um, so I kind of had my preferences and, and told her why those were my preferences and, and she agreed. Um, and so I actually ended up gendering um, the title and the way I've rendered it is, is how dark the skin is left by, or how dark my skin is left by her shadow. Um, so when we had the conversation, I was like, I think it feels better to say my, because the, the poem unfolds in a way that feels very personal. Um, and to know that it's like this female lover, because there's like a lot of stuff about the body throughout the, the, the book. Um, but it was one of those things where I just had to write out the title, um, and then there's the title poem as well. I did just write it out kind of 10 different ways um, and go through what each of those ways means and and also think about what does it mean that I do want, want to like kind of queer code um, 
the title the US and the UK like you know some journals are specifically geared towards like lesbian poetry and so like what does it mean that I want to make sure that it's queer coded so that I could submit it you know there's all these kinds of questions um that came into play um but yeah thank you yeah I, and um we'll be touching on kind of that question of um working with authors who are still around so you can bounce those ideas off and Ari and I'm, I'm sure you too as well have experience of um translating texts where you don't know the author where you don't have that communication um Anton I wondered if you could introduce yourself uh with a queer translating joy and challenge sure um I get asked this question a lot like when I I get invited to um uh like panels like this um because i'm you know a visibly queer translator and i've written about it a lot and the question that i get a lot um is like so what makes a translation queer or what does it mean to queer a translation like like do you just like make everything gay in the translation and well yes that is definitely something that i do i make everything gay in the translation even when it's not <laughs> but also um i think more importantly is what I do uh, is I'm really, really glad that Ari mentioned all of the things that they were looking at um, with the Japanese and the, with the kanji and the, and uh, also what Leila was saying about pronouns and also um, things that really have nothing to do with, I don't know, like men having sex with men and women having sex with women or whatever. Like, because what, what uh, we, what they just described, like the, the sort of issues and problems and, um, like worries and concerns that they have uh, as uh, when they're querying a translation or when they're doing a queer translation is very, very much what I think of when I'm thinking of, oh, what does it mean to queer a translation? I think if we were to really um, distill like to the essence of what a queer translation is, although everything that has to do with querying is completely antithetical to the essential, I'm very well aware of that, well aware, aware, aware of that but um, like bear with me here. If we were to distill it, if we could, then I would say that to queer a translation or a queered translation means you break down the barrier of something. It's just like what Ari said. It's just like what Leila said. You break down the barrier between two things that look very separate, but are actually kind of when you take out this, when you take out the artificial separation, the um, the false binary, it becomes like, oh, this is actually one thing. It's actually it makes perfect sense in one language when it made perfect sense in the previous language. So um, to give you an example, um, like my early work, I in, initially, like in the beginning of my career, I was known for doing these like very thick, difficult historical books. They were either uh, historical novels that are written about the past or they were written in the past. So I had to do a lot of like research and they were very kind of, you know, research heavy basically um, works. And one of the things, so I had kind of like fell into a very academic mindset. I just graduated from my master's program. And so what I would do is yeah, I would italicize the words that were not in the OED. <laughs> I mean, it's very funny to think of now because the trend is very different now, but back then that's what, you, but that's what we did, right? And so, I would italicize these words. And so these words would be like screaming, like the fact that they were the other, like, ooh, I am from another language. Like it would be like blinking headlights, LED flashing kind of signaling. And there would be other things that um, that would, you know, that I would do, uh, like um, I kind of, I really wanted to use footnotes at one point, but um, American, <laughs> readers apparently hate footnotes and you know will throw their book across the room if they see a footnote so um I was kind of like di uh, disabused of that notion um and the other thing was um uh, this very recently like uh an, uh an editor like suggested that I add a glossary to a book and I was like well I'm not against the idea of making things like easier for readers but at the same time uh, a, it's a lot of work and I hate to work. I'm very lazy. B, it's like, you know, it's a huge, like unnecessary signal. Um, I've stealth glossed everything in the work where you may not know like the exact definition of a word, of a Korean word that I put into the text, but you at least know like the vicinity of its meaning and like, you know enough about it to understand the text. And if you want to know more about that word, then you can look it up. Like that's like the extent of the glossing, the stealth glossing that I do, that, you know, most translators nowadays do. 
But like back then, it was like we have to have all of these, you know, accoutrements to uh, to the prose, and we have to make it so that it's very exotic and exotically Korean and whatnot. And as um, my career progressed, and as the translation world itself kind of so- sort of became, um, I guess it's it's becoming more success like. Ever since 2016, when the first International Booker Prize was awarded, like the like the International Booker Prize as it exists in the current form, I feel like a translation has kind of gone through a sea change where it's now frowned upon to italicize words. Um, Oka, uh, Kairani Baroka has a really great essay about this. Just like type Oka, italicizing translation, and I think it'll come up on Google. Um, there's a really great essay about this. Um, the whole thing about gendered pronouns, for example, what Leila was mentioning. Like now, if I use they, you know, in a text, like no one blinks an eye. That's so great because Korea also does not have gendered pronouns. So it is like fabulous that we have this. Or, you know, I could just, you know, use a. I haven't used like any of the newer pronouns yet because I feel like, well, they, Jane Austen used they, and I'm a big fan. So I'm like, okay, so it's good, good enough for her. It's good enough for me. But yeah, so I feel like translation itself is kind of becoming more and more queered um, since 2016 when I started. And um, it's a really, really exciting time to be a translator. And um, I think if you look at my work now, uh, for example, like Cursed Bunny, Violets, uh, Violets by Kyung Suk Shin, Cursed Bunny by Bora Chung, or Love in the Big City by Sang Young Park. Like obviously, Sang Young, like Love in the Big City, it's a big gay novel. But I feel like in terms of translation being queered, I feel like Violets, uh, which is not an overtly gay novel, or um, Cursed Bunny, which is not a novel, which is which is not even a novel, or it's it's not even like you know, a collection of queer fiction as we would call it. I feel like they're both very queer in that they break down genres. Kyung Suk Shin, her entire career is about breaking down the ba- barrier, the boundary between fiction and memory, like something, it's like auto fiction, but also you kind of like read it assuming it's auto fiction and then something totally made up comes along or something like, you know that at some, at some point you're like, I don't know if this is her memory speaking or I don't know if this, she's, this is the writer speaking, like I don't know who, what is, which is which but it all kind of coheres together into one whole. And to me, that is what it means to queer literature and to, to read queerly and to achieve that effect in a translation is exactly what I'm going for. And that I believe is, is queer translation. Thank you, what, what, what an answer. Um, Leila, do you have anything to add to that? You shared a text um, before, the, uh, before we started speaking um, from Julia Sanchez. And she describes um, translation or um, kind of a, her version of translation is uh, to delight in the ripples that the translation process leaves in the final product. And that kind of breaking down of genres, Anton, that you were talking about, for me, resonates with that quote. Um, Leila, I wonder if that's something that you look for in when you're um, translating works or if that's something that you're very conscious of. It's something that I've become conscious of. I mean, I think I've been doing a lot of thinking about, you know, the translator's identity and how that like can help or hinder. Um, I loved what Anton said about, um, you know, an academic mindset, like not in a bad way, but just like as a translator, a lot of times we need to do research and depending on what overlap of marginalized communities you might be coming from, some people's like knee jerk reaction or just like mode of being in the world is by doing a lot of research because you constantly feel like you're an outsider or you constantly feel like you're having to like go through all these hoops to to fit in um which sometimes is really great like i i was thinking about um like you know that julia sanchez article one thing i love about it is that there's this idea of like there for many people, for most of the people, there's not some sort of like one mother tongue. Um, and certainly there are a lot of things that I was unconscious of, for example, being like born and raised in Texas um, and not really understanding that other Englishes existed until I came up against them. Um, and one of the first texts that I was actually translating just completely on my own, just trying out like, you know, what is this even to translate was a text written by um, a poet called 
Oscar Curiesis, um, and he was, I think this was his first work of fiction, but he took on the voice of the painter Francis Bacon um, and kind of wrote this experimental diary, read more like a manifesto, like it's very much not a novel in any sort of like traditional sense. Um, and so I was, I was translating this text and I knew that the poet had watched a lot of like interviews with Francis Bacon and like some of the like some of the text was actually almost verbatim quotes. And so I ended up just doing this long tumble down YouTube videos, which was available to me, like luckily, cause I'm, you know, became a translator when the internet was a thing. Um, and so I was able to just kind of like tumble down these YouTube videos um, and explore an English that was very, very different from the English that I was, you know, born and raised with. And so I was kind of like, you know, translating, trying to capture Francis Bacon's voice in some ways, but still trying to capture this poet's voice. Um, and so, I mean, I guess I'm like kind of talking around your question, but like that was an experience where I was like, right, um, Englishes are, are what I'm playing with here. It's not just like the source text or different languages. Um, and one of the ways I feel like this shows up most or like it, that it like kind of rings alarm bells, um, both thinking about like queer texts and, and gender, but also race is like, um, you know, thinking about slurs and terms that are like really, really loaded. Um, and it most often like, you know, calls my attention when it's done badly. Um, and, and then, and, and so that came up in the Francis Bacon text. And so I was actually like, you know, I was hunting for him, like using like different terms and like, what would, what would he say? And like, what would, what's been, what, how has it been translated basically from English to Spanish? And then how can I get it back to Francis Bacon's English? Um, and so in those ways, I feel like I specifically, cause that project was kind of the first one that I was working on, like a trans, or, um, uh, like investigation and research, um, like kind of like over researching something is almost like my go-to reaction. But I think it, it's helpful to like be really conscious about where I'm coming from to know like where I need to research into, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, Ari, I wonder if you have um, a same the same approach in terms of that research heavy, um, especially when working with historic texts and um, as Leila was saying, you're you're almost juggling a couple of voices there and um, a couple of yeah, it's not only the the time difference or the language difference; it's different people and different um, voices that you're having to bear in mind. So I wonder if that's something uh, you explore when you're translating, especially older texts. Yeah, it, it, it's a good question, and I really appreciate what uh, Leila and Anton were just saying as well. Um, everything from the idea of uh, stealth glossing, which I <laughs> which I love, um, the idea of kind of fitting in a context to um, Leila, what I, one of the things I was getting from what you were saying as well was just that reminder that um, that English isn't, no language is stable anyway. Um, it's constantly changing. And I think we tend to think of translators, a default everyday assumption about translators is that we are a mirror. Um, you just kind of reproduce this text and there's no change involved in some fundamental way, but actually, um, you know, a powerful translation can, change English as as it as it moves as it's working um, there's a lot of responsibility there um, there's a lot that can go wrong um, but in in that sense um, you um, Nia with respect to your question about historical texts or for example uh, the texts by authors who are not alive to consult you know without wanting to sound too cheesy in some cases I feel like there's some channeling involved you know there's yes I do do a lot of research of course um but then at some level I'm also trying to be trying to reconstruct a position um and be in it um maybe it's like acting although I'm an absolutely terrible actor so maybe I'll just throw that metaphor out of the window but um you have to kind of really inhabit the mind or try to understand what the mind of the author might be. And um, usually, uh, in my case anyway, I just need a lot of help. So I ask people, uh, I ask native speakers, I consult. Um, once I've got a, a solid draft where I feel relatively confident about the, the more literal meanings, then I read other books in similar genres and 
um, cross-referenced just for style. And then finally, I wind up after usually many, many drafts. I don't know about um, Leila and Anton, how many, how you work with drafts, but I usually have just God knows how many millions of drafts. And uh, by the time I reach a sort of late phase, then I'll I'll hand the draft to um, a, a speaker of English who doesn't know any Chinese at all um, to to get their feeling for it. Who's a writer in the genre in the target genre, and then work from there. So there's a lot of conversation back and forth, and then I finally reach that golden moment where I get to take the this this most recent draft back to the original and see if it really is conveying some of what the original wanted to do. I mean, sometimes it's fairly straightforward, as you know, like sometimes uh, the the grammar or the content of a paragraph is, you know, it's descriptive. There are some objects there on the table, but other times it's a lot more abstract in what order they go in and the way that the, the, the kind of long game of what the author is trying to do really is a factor in how you how you set the table. So yeah, complicated and difficult. So some combination of research, maybe a little bit of um, of uh, of channeling. I haven't used a Ouija board yet for that, but maybe someday. There's still time. There's still time. Um, <laughs> Next project. How, yeah. Um, on kind of a more practical note, how do all three of you or do you find yourself prioritizing queer works when it comes to translation? And of course, Anton, you touched on, you know, works like queer, uh, Cursed Bunny. Like it's it's maybe not being advertised as a queer work, but it is through those kind of um, overcoming certain binaries and um, expectations from the reader or the industry or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I wonder how how do you prioritize um, those queer texts in your work? and um, yeah, that's that's my question there. Um, so, oh gosh, it's it's never it's often like not so clear that this is a queer text, and it's often not so clear that this is a queer author, and I have learned that. Um, with my with my authors, I've translated many authors, so please do not try to guess like which author I'm talking about. But like, for example, I've had an author who like hasn't come out, and so I'm like, hmm. But this work is very clear, and you know that I'm going to gay it up a lot. So, and they're like, yeah, do whatever you feel is is like the best way to do it. Um, but I can't come out. <laughs> because I'm not comfortable with that. And I was like, okay, I can respect that. Uh, I will see what I can do. And so like, sometimes it's that kind of situation. There is an author that I kind of suspect is queer, but will not admit it. <laughs> and so um, there's, a, there's an author who came out to me, a couple of authors who came out to me, but not to the public. Uh, and they're very, but they're very, very like happy for the work to be queered up and to be made very, very queer. And it's very interesting because like, it's not like I selected these works because they were queer. It's just that they turned out to be queer. And I think there's something there. Um, like when I was reading them, um, I kind of read them out of the closet. And of course, this is not something, you know, revolutionary in 2023. I mean, we have had Eve Kozowski Sedgwick for like a million years now. And, you know, so we, we all know how to read things out of the closet and we all know how to do a queer reading. And so for me, um, what's it? I think it was the translator Soje, uh, Korean translator Soje, who uh, once said to me, like, you know, it's really great to have like super, super fabulous gay authors, but also there's something interesting about the kind of open secret, um, kind of weirdly, are they or not they um, works and then handling them and trying to like toe the line between translating a really, really queer work and not translating a really queer... I wish I could give you like very specific examples, <laughs> but I can't. And it's very frustrating. But <laughs> like um, maybe if you kind of like looked at all the things that I translated and be like, hmm, I wonder who he's talking about. But like, yeah, I think a lot of the works that I kind of choose end up being queer or I find very queer ways of doing it. Or um, for example, or, or, you know, a lot of my authors are like really happy with, you know, queering something or making it like queer 
Um, I remember um, there was this magazine that um, accepted um, queer, uh, like queer poetry translations, like for their queer issue. And I was like, okay, um, I don't, like I only have one poet that I translate, but he's I don't know what his deal is. So I asked him, hey, so I'm going to submit these poems to this queer issue, and he goes, oh, um, does doesn't the poet have to be queer or something? And I was like. Well, we can kind of like say that, you know, the translator is queer. So this is a queer translation. And then he goes, oh, OK, let's do that. Like, this is Kim On. He's a very, very sweet guy. And I was like, oh, OK, so I guess I guess that that makes it a queer translation. They it didn't get accepted, but um, I don't think it got rejected either um, because, you know, he wasn't an out queer or whatever. But it kind of did make me realize that, oh, it doesn't really matter what I translate, because as long as I translate it, then it becomes a queer translation. Um, yeah, I know this is also kind of like imbuing the translation with my essential queerness or whatever, but I don't know. I feel like everything I touch kind of turns to queer or turns <laughs> into rainbows. And I am I'm not against that. I think that's a very good thing. And um, yeah, I'm going to continue doing that. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Leila, um, what, what do you think about uh, the question or any response to Anton's comments there? Um, well, I feel like I'm just going to like use it as my guiding life or my guiding light yeah. for like the rest of my life. Like, that's what I'm going to aspire to do. Um, I mean, honestly, I feel like I'm, I'm too early on in my, in my translation career journey. Like I, um, I came to translation as a poet first, as someone who just, I took a translation workshop because I just was interested in it as when I was getting my MFA in poetry and I started working, well, I, I guess I first started translating um, this this poet who I mentioned with the Francis Bacon Project, Oscar Curieses, who, um, yeah, like, I don't actually know if he would strictly even consider himself queer. Like, certainly it, it depends on, it would depend on what day you asked him, honestly. Um, but, you know, he had this major obsession with Francis Bacon. A lot of his other poems, you could definitely make an argument for, like, many, many queer readings. Um, but, like, I guess that the text that I was drawn to, like, you know, I wasn't ever asked by publisher to translate anything. I wasn't ever... Um, kind of like translating as a, a translator as a job description initially it was just like what text do I really like um, and I really enjoy like hybrid texts and I really enjoyed reading queer texts and so those were just like the texts that I was drawn to at first and so the Francis Bacon project which I'm hoping will be like my first published um, book I did just completely as um, like I hate the phrase like labor of love but it was just like you know I was working as an elementary school teacher in these rural schools in the south of Spain um, and I would like, you know, buy a sleeve of double stuffed Oreos and like work on the translation a little bit every day. And it was not a long, it's not a long book. And it took me just so, so long when I like think about, or when I hear about like these translators who are like paid to do translations and can like set schedules. And like now since then I've been able to do that, but you know, that was very just like, you know, piecemeal. I just loved the book and I wanted to translate it. Um, and then in the case of um, Oscura Deja La Piel, um, Su Sombra, that was like the same thing. It's like I found the text and I wanted to translate it. And so it's just accidentally, I've, I've mainly been a translator of queer texts so far, um, but I don't know what, like, I don't know what that would look like in, in the future. But I certainly like, if I had my druthers, like I would just translate text like hybrid hybrid strange texts that are probably you know including queer themes so this is more of like an aspirational question to me of like what I would like to translate in the future that's so helpful because a lot of this uh, a lot of the people watching I'm sure as well are at the start of their um translation journeys or and like you said taking that time to really enjoy a text and enjoy or kind of relish in the process of translating it without the kind of time constraints. I think there's there's something um, special and important to that in itself as a practice. Um, Ari, how about you? How do you, um, oh wait, I think. <laughs> um, if any of you have questions for each other as well, please do uh, feel free to chime in. Um, sure. Uh, um, the, yeah, that's so stimulating. I love 
hearing about these the, your different experiences as um, I was thinking how um, you know one thing I I for myself that I've learned um, is th that whatever it is that you're going to translate you're, you're likely to spend a lot of time with it <laughs> maybe more time with it than you spend with your cat or your partner um, and a much more intimate level um, so it helps if you're connected to it in some way and for me, an early translation experience I had was working on a book that I did not like. Um, I took the job as a, I mean, I'm my real my job job is as an academic. So translation is something I consider as a sort of service work um, that I also enjoy uh, as part of that larger picture. But that that first one of those early pieces, uh, I thought I was deliberately uh, doing it because I thought I'll I'll give this a try. Um, I'll get paid for it. I'll get some experience um, and 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 work on it. But I I didn't feel for the author. I didn't the work didn't resonate for me, um, and I kind of felt like Scarlett O'Hara on the top of a hill holding my dirty carrot. Like I'm never going back. Like I'm only going to work with texts that resonate for me from from now on. And I might not always be able to put it into words. Ironically, what it is that resonates about a certain text, but that's that. And I've been practicing that way ever since. It does make a difference, um, and and it really means that your that investment. I think um, Tiffany Chow was talking about that emotional investment in a text in the keynote lecture as well. Um, it really makes a difference, I think, in the quality of the of what you produce as well. Although it's not always positive either. So if if the work that speaks to you is very dark, um, and uh, and resonates with you in a way that you know can take you some very dark places then there you are on that journey with with uh with the book so I, i'm thinking of course of chimyajin's work um and in that case um one of the things that kept me going was thinking well her readers are experiencing this is what it draws her her readers in chinese to it and if i can communicate that same feeling in english if readers in english who have no other exposure are moved in the same way, then that will be a success. But it involved inhabiting that dark space for a long time, which I, I it's why it was a very short book and it took forever because I could only be in it for a few minutes, <laughs> only in it for a short time uh, each each session. I'm not really sure how I got there. I guess the other thing I was thinking while while listening to you, Leila and Anton, was just that um just this uh, that old sawhorse that um you know, really reading, all reading is translation. When you pick up a book, even if it's in a language you're, you were born to learn how to read or whatever, you, you're already translating, that's happening. So I would put uh, the kind of translators that we are on the spectrum of readership more generally. And so that with the, to add the queer back into that, then um, uh, yeah, it's like Anton was saying as well. So is it that we're queer and so that anything we do is queer, <laughs> After, uh, which I, I love that as a very utopian vision. And I'm going to like, like Leila, I'm going to adopt it going forward. Um, or is it that it has to be the author who is in some way queer, who decides anyway, and especially historically, we don't want to read back, you know, and take the categories from today and read, read through our own lens and our own values uh, that will do a disservice to, to many texts. So I often cite the example of um, uh, probably the most famous work of Chinese literary, of Chinese literary history of all time um, from several hundred years ago, uh, the story of the stone, which is also translated as um, dream of the red chamber. It's, I think you could ask anyone. I, I, th I think anybody out there is probably who, who knows the book is knows that I'm not exaggerating. If I say that is, probably the most well-loved book in all of Chinese literary history, or one of them. And its main character is this uh, effeminate boy who likes to wear lipstick and he sleeps with men, he sleeps with women, he's just very sensitive. He's never been, it would be kind of, you, you, you could be forgiven for looking at that character and saying, oh, he's queer. Uh, or he's even non-binary, I don't know, uh, transgender in some way, something like, but I think that in some, that that mm, you'd be forcing the issue to some extent. I mean, you could adopt him or you could not, or maybe it means re reconfiguring a, a book that's normally been viewed uncritically and saying, well, hey guys, actually this 
this is quite a queer text. So there's a lot of different approaches, but uh, that's an example of, um, of I guess, queerness avant la lettre. Thank you. Um, we've had some interesting comments um, on the live stream, so I'll just put some of those to you as well. Uh, so Sorsha says, Ari and Anton, both of your work is so deeply corporeal. Can you speak to queer embodiment and how that works in translation? Hmm. Um, maybe I can say something. The, um... This, this also goes, um, builds on uh, what both Leila and Ari were talking about um, when it comes to like triangulating the voice of the translation and uh, like, oh, which voice do I use? Like, how do I capture the voice? How do I, or how do I, you know, inhabit the voice, the proper voice and for this translation? How do I find it? And Leila, Leila was talking about all the troubles that she was having uh, and all the joys that she was having in, in finding like Francis Bacon again. And uh, like Ari was talking about like the acting thing or the channeling thing. And Ari was like, I know this is very corny or something like, what are you talking about? Like I do that all the time. I channel all the time. <laughs> um, so there are there are three actresses that I always talk about when I, when I talk about triangulation, uh, Helen Mirren, Nicole Kidman and Meryl Streep. So <laughs> Helen Mirren uh, in an interview about playing the queen um, in the movie, The Queen, uh, she was very, very nervous about like how she's going to play this character who actually exists and is very iconic. And then she sort of she said, "Oh, once, but once I discovered the voice, once I knew how she would sound, I could build the entire character around the voice." And so, and that's what she did. Um, Nicole Kidman said something really interesting uh, when she was playing Virginia Woolf in The Hours. She said in the DVD commentary. Uh, that she had listened to recordings of uh, Virginia Woolf, but Virginia Woolf at the time, like her accent is just so comical to hear now that it would just be too distracting for the audience, for the modern audience. So she had to bring, um, she, she had to find like a midpoint between her own voice, Nicole Kidman's voice and Virginia Woolf's voice. And that actually sounded more true to, you know, the, the script and to the, the work of art that they were creating than like Virginia Woolf's literal actual voice. And uh, Meryl Streep said something really interesting about accents. Uh, like when you ask Meryl Streep, like, is it really hard to do all these accents? She's like, the accents are not hard. It's only hard when you're switching from one, when you're shooting one movie and then you're shooting another and the accents happen to be like really close together. Like she has to do a Swedish accent after doing a Danish accent, like that's hard. But if she has to do like, I don't know, an Iowa accent after a something totally random, like uh, something else accent, like it's it's much easier for her to like make that switch. And so it's, um, and I thought that was like really, really interesting because I also, for me, when I switch from one book to another and I've had to do that a lot recently, I feel like, like when I'm doing a sample of another book in the middle of translating another book, I, I feel like it's just, it's so, it's such a cognitive load because ugh, I have to like find get into this whole other voice again. And it's so hard. And this, is, this connects to um, uh, what, what Mia, you were asking about the body, because like, I feel like my body is doing this. Like, I can't do this part intellectually. I have to kind of be like an actor. I have to inhabit the role. I have to like slip, be, be one thing physically and then be another thing physically. Like my brain has to basically be another brain thinking in a different way and working in a different way. way. Like, um, I read somewhere that um, the uh, people with, uh, I, I know it's not called multiple personality disorder anymore, it's called this associative dissociative disorder something, but uh, people with multiple, with more than one personality, let's say, uh, when they switch between personalities, like each, even though biologically it's the same body, they have different like heart rates, like different blood sugar levels, like, you know, everything, like they biologically change, like their bodies change when they're in the different personalities and that's how it feels when i'm shifting from one book to another when i when i have to find another voice once i find the voice once i have it i'm like oh i like i have it like i can build the entire translation around that so it gets it becomes so much easier in my job once i find the voice but it's that finding of the voice that like makes it really really kind of tricky to be a translator because and like, sometimes I'm, I'd be like, well, I don't, I'd often be like, oh, I've never done this before. I don't know how to do it. 
I would tell my clients that I can do anything and I can translate anything because, you know, I am a liar. But when I'm in my own head and, I have, and I'm doing my job, I'm like, okay, how am I going to do this? Um, for example, I'm doing a fantasy book right now. I actually really hate fantasy. I love science fiction, but for some reason, fantasy just doesn't jive with me. But I wanted to do a fantasy work because I hate it so much. I wanted to be able to find a voice for it because I feel like if I could come up with like a really great translation of a fantasy novel from Korean into English, then I would have like gone up to the next level in my practice. Like I would be like, I would be so happy with myself. No one's going to care. Like no one's going to give me a Hugo award or whatever, but I would care. And I'm finding it like extremely physical, but very, very satisfying in the sense that sometimes like when you climb a mountain, it's like, I mean, I don't go hiking, like I don't do that, but I imagine like when you go hiking, um, like it's very difficult when you're, you know, hiking up the mountain, but once you're at the summit, you're like, oh, this is why you do it, right? So that's kind of like the stage I am at now. Um, I, when I took on the job, I was like, I can do it. And then I'm thinking, no, I can't. And then, but then another, and then even further back in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, you know, whatever you throw yourself at, you'll come up with something. So just have faith and just do it. And so I did it. I, I just kept translating. I'm like, wow, this is crap. This is horrible. I'm so horrible. This author's horrible. I hate my life. Why am I doing this to myself? Am I a masochist? Blah, blah, blah. But, but my body kept translating while my mind kept like, you know, being a hater. But my body kept translating. And so that's kind of like, you kind of have to get over that kind of, that slump, that valley of death, that kind of like state where you, that where you know you're full of doubt but there's a sudden point where suddenly you take a giant leap like and then you're like oh I got it I got the voice and once you have the voice like everything is just like gets becomes so much easier you're like translating 10,000 words a day you're like it's it's fabulous it's fantastic it's totally worth it and so um yeah I think um it is a very physical act and you do have to throw your body into it and there's no way to intellectually predict that you can pull it off but um, you probably can. Anton is here to tell you that you probably can. So um, yeah, go for it. Brilliant, brilliant. I love that we had mountain, climbing mountain metaphors, Nicole Kidman and Meryl Streep all in that, that one answer. Um, Leila and um, Ari as well, you've, you've spoken about your own writing practice, whether that's art essays or critical essays or poetry as well. I wonder if you find that like inhabiting a voice um through your translations is that helped by your own creative practice like how do the two work together um because again even even the fact that you both write and translate and have your own creative practice that itself is um overcoming those binaries of like you've got a writer and you've got a translator or you've got text going from one language to another or you know so um, yeah, Leila, I wonder if you, you had anything to say on that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, also, yeah, I'm taking a bit too much like inspiration from this, <laughs> from this panel already. Um, uh, well, part of it, like th there is a, definitely a really positive relationship between translating and writing, but like a little bit about what Anton just said, like kind of about that like voice in the back of your head that says you can't do it. When I was thinking about this panel, I also realized that like the lines or like the imposter syndrome um, just kind of like flows through all of my identities like pretty strongly. Like when I started out being a writer, it was like, oh, you're not very good. You're not a good poet, like yada, yada, yada. Um, translator, like, you know, you're just starting out. No one's paying you to do this. Like you're just doing it <laughs> like you're you're an elementary school teacher. You're not really a translator. Um, but then even like getting into things like, you know, being biracial and not being black enough or um, being, you know, somewhere in the middle of gender identities, like still very much in the process of figuring it out, seeing people who I like, I'm jealous of their life kind of thing and don't really know how I can like be where they are. Um, or like, you know, the, the ideas of bisexuality and like, I just kind of identifying with your partner, who they are in the moment. And, you know, you turn straight once you're in a heterosexual looking relationship or you're queer, if you're in a queer looking relationship, um, all of those kinds of imposter syndromes, um, I realized at the very least, it kind of like flow through everything evenly. 
So like when I am in the middle of a translation that feels like I can't do it. Um, sometimes it's like bouncing between the different identities is helpful. Like I can take refuge in one if I'm stuck with the translation. Sometimes I bounce to my like other creative work and somehow like the poems will flow. And if I have writer's block um, with something I'm trying to work on, then sometimes it's it's a translation that kind of unlocks something for me. And I think beginning to be a translator definitely like tightened up my poetry or like made it more serious in some ways when I was starting out as a poet. I think I was coming a lot from loving Edgar Allan Poe and loving E.E. E. Cummings and like these like really just like I'm going to have fun on the page, which is also still really wonderful and, and why I returned to poems. But sometimes like, you know, the way I was playing with language was just completely like it was just for myself. Um, and it was only when I started translating that I realized, oh, if you try to translate this, this is only interesting in English. Like some things are only interesting in English because you're playing with the way English works. Um, and if I try to translate into Spanish, it would either only be interesting with a footnote or it would, you know, you would have to just completely change it. And so I think translation changed the way I thought about writing. I think it's still really important to play with language and to play with the very particularities of specific languages, but it made me interrogate why I was doing that. Um, and so if I'm gonna be super playful with English, like does it actually serve a purpose or do I just want to show someone that I've like noticed that there are different words inside of words? Um, and I think it made me, like translation made me more serious as a writer and then being a writer allowed me to find more creative solutions for translation. Mm. Well, that, that uh, what you were just saying makes resonates strongly with me as well. I feel like the um, the processes, the translating and the the writing, really work together. Have worked together for me, um, or they've happened at different times of life. So maybe I, before becoming an academic, I did some kind of writing. I did. I grew up with art and art history and whatever. I thought about it, you know, as as oxygen. And then put it aside for academic writing, which trains you in one, just basically one kind of format or one mode of thinking. And then reading some a text as closely as you have to to translate it can really break apart the um, the I'm, I'm lacking words at this moment, ironically, but the way that academic writing will insist that it's the only way. Um, sometimes a uh, really good experimental novel in another language can just break that into little pieces and. You're, and I, I felt like I'm able to put it to one side and come back to the writing that's more meaningful. To be uh, more creative doesn't mean to be inauthentic. You know, I think the academic writing often will suggest otherwise, like the minute that you introduce personal pronoun or take a creative like journey somewhere, then suddenly the writing is not um, as you know research focused, but that hasn't been my experience. Um, and so now I think, um, you know, when I'm deep in a translation, I start to uh, think more deeply about structure, more deliberately about how to shape something instead of simply uh, as presenting research, but how to craft something, the craft of something, um, and then what the voice might mean as well. And um, I think in my case, though, I, I have been historically, coming back to the embodiment question, maybe uh, maybe a little bit repressed. And so in the course of my writing career and translating career, I've really learned from the authors I, I've worked with how to be more embodied, you know, to the point where I've learned how to write it back in. So the writing I've done more recently, more and more now, I've kind of deliberately incorporated, it. I've actually put references to the myself or the breathing or anything, sort of yoga type practice right back in the text and it becomes a whole other animal. It's kind of like having a second life. Um, and I, I blame translation for that. I thank translation for that. Thank you. Uh, we have another question um, from someone tuning in live. So Bryony asks, have any of you ever had any pushback from editors, authors, or publishers for over querying a translation, maybe for using language, um, which is so novel that it hasn't been accepted? And if so, how have you dealt with this? Mm. 
or maybe you haven't and you're you're picking um great editors and authors to work with i think people have this idea like i can tell what people think of me how they think of me when they talk to me but people have this idea that i'm like very radical but when but korean translators um especially for example like smoking tigers like they know that i'm actually quite conservative and reactionary <laughs> and so um everything that i know about querying and querying translations like i know from younger translators um and i learned from them uh, for example victoria coddle was really the one who kind of outlined to me like oh this is what a queer translation or a queered translation would look like uh, she was really the one who taught me that and also like sojay you know what has has always taught me a lot of stuff about um like how a translator should be and how a translator a queer translator uh, doing a queer like should embody should comport themselves and so it's always been like for me it's i've never like done something like super daring where i'm like oh, ta this is an incredible word why don't you whatever in fact very interestingly this is a story that i tell over and over again um if anything um it's my publishers who my editors who suggest like querying things um for example when um when i was translating love in the big city uh deborah smith did the editing before it went over to uh, peter blackstock at grove and they were both you know frankly much more <laughs> progressive than i was um for example with deborah I, I remember she's like reading a part and she's like oh they're at a sashimi restaurant but like why is you know everything kind of janky I mean, sashimi is an expensive food. And I was like, oh, it's not sashimi per se. It's, you know, Korean hue. It's raw fish. So it's, you know, a very kind of a very down to earth restaurant, let's say. And then she's like, oh, then call it hue. Don't call it sashimi. <laughs> like, don't call it Korean sashimi. And I was like, why am I calling it sashimi? And so I, I put in the word hue, which no one in the, in the Anglosphere knows. But, you know, if they're curious, I mean, I describe what they're eating. So I, I assume an English reader is going to go, oh, I guess hue means raw fish, if they think about it at all. I mean, the word only appears once. So, so, so like she fixed that. Um, and Peter Blackstock, he was like looking at things like, you, Anton, you keep mentioning side dishes. Like, what if side dishes? Do you mean banchan? And I'm like, oh my God, like, how do you know what banchan is? And um, banchan is basically, you know, Korean style side dishes. And, you know, uh, I should have known, you know, he's a New Yorker, he lives in New York and he's been to Korean restaurants. So, so I changed all references to side dishes into banchan. So in my experience, if anything, it's been kind of like editors who've been um, uh, very suggestive in those things. There are times when, for example, um, I don't like, I don't want to really because there are certain power relations, I can't really get into like what goes on during the editing process, like specifically, but I will tell you that 100% of the editors that I've worked with have been extremely receptive to what I have to say as a translator, even when I'm not the author. Like I've never had a, I've never had a editor go like, oh, you're just a translator. Like, oh, like this is what we're going to do. Or, you know, um, it's always been like editing is not, is not you know editors like commanding me to do something like i'm not an editor's secretary like and they don't treat you like they're your secretary they treat uh translators like when they when they talk editing they always treat it as a dialogue they're like this is what i'm suggesting as the editor this is our house style and i feel like it would be clearer this way what do you think and then you have to push back if it's an issue that you feel very very strongly about so I think uh, my advice for a lot of people starting out or like younger writers is that like, don't be intimidated by your editor. Your editor does not expect you to do everything they say. Your editor expects you to push back. Your editor expects you to have a dialogue with them. They know that it's a discussion that this process is. So I want you to do that and not simply like, you know, accept changes on the document on, on everything they say. Oh, there is a, another really interesting um, uh, thing that happened to me uh, in terms of Korean translation and editing, and I have to give credit for this. So Emma Herdman, who uh, edited um, I Want to Die, But I Want to Eat Tteokbokki by Peck uh, which was published in, by Bloomsbury in both the US and the UK. So she is my editor uh, for that book in the UK. So um, 
I kind of like made the, the there's a main character in that book and she talks about her partners and she never really specifies whether they're boyfriends or girlfriends she just says you know my my aide my lover and so I made everything gender neutral I made all the partners gender neutral and I explained like in the first in my first draft I was like I am a queer translator I demand that this be queered and then Emma was like okay yeah, uh, we, should, we could go with that. And then in the second draft, I was like, uh, am I imposing this onto the text? Am I just being too invasive? Because again, I'm quite reactionary slash conservative in translation, not in real life, hopefully. Uh, and so, and so, so I switched, I changed like, I think one of the lovers into a boyfriend. And then Emma immediately emailed me. She's like, what happened? I thought we were, you know, doing the whole we were querying the text and then I was like well blah 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 I thought that I was you know being overreacting and you know just you know being too gay and then she was like wait one second and then she went to the author Pixicky and then she talked to the author and said well this is what Anton thinks and I and I agree with him like what well, like wh what do you think we should do I kind of agree with I agree with Anton but what do you think we should do and Pixie immediately said oh make them all queer <laughs> queer it all so I have to give big props to both Pixehi, our ally, <laughs> my ally Pixehi, uh, and to Emma, who is also an ally to Emma Herdman uh, at Bloomsbury UK, because, you know, if it weren't for their intervention, then we would have gone with my stupid reactionary um, translation. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I can definitely vouch for the fact that it's the the conversation starts when the translator gives that first draft of the of the translation to the editor and those conversations and the things that come out of that are, are so interesting and like you say it's the text isn't finished until well if it's ever finished um until it's there in the in the printed form so yeah those conversations and those changes are, are great i've just got um one last thing to kind of round us off on um Ari, your uh, book, The Membranes, is a work of speculative fiction, which came out in Taiwan in 1995, and um, I believe is the first uh, novel in modern Chinese to feature a trans feminine protagonist. Uh, and in an interview with World Literature Today, today, you say that trans translators and our allies have to be mindful of exactly which binaries, both concrete and abstract, we are working with when we bring trans from one literature to another. So I wonder if you could expand on um, this point to round us off, um, either with reference to the membrane or another project of yours. Sure, uh, and it's it's an interesting um, uh, rabbit hole, um, but uh, sort of like Anton was saying as well. Um, in uh, in Chinese, also there's the luxury of not having a gender pronoun. So um, at least in spoken Mandarin, you can have entire conversations where um, it's utterly reasonable to not assume um, what is the gender or sex of the people that are being talked about. And um, you may be, you might use context clues, but it's just, it's not a given. Um, in written uh, Chinese up until relatively recently, uh, in so-called modern times, um, it, all through the pre-modern period, there was also just the the the, the written form also wasn't um, binaristic. So it means that now, like for many translators working in languages, but I th it sounds like this was also uh, Leila also relevant to the work you were describing um, as well. That there there are times when you have to, as a translator into English with English as the target language, you've got to make this decision to add a gender or a sex that might not necessarily be there, you really lose that ambiguity. And um, that's a tragic loss, I think, in my case. It, it personally, I, I'd much rather not uh, lose that. So that's that's one thing. Um, the, also the idea of this moment that, that we're in, in English of attention to gender binaries um, and the many languages that are springing up to accommodate um, this kind of, of uh, this family tree, this ever growing tree of, of gender and sex. It, it doesn't necessarily translate um, horizontally or vertically. It's 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 really of a moment. So it's more that if someone um, is translating something from English to Chinese now, they're going to be coping with how do we manage this um, this 
you know, thicket of gender pronouns. So it kind of, kind of turned the question upside down um, that highlights the, the challenge there. Um, but then all, again, all so all of the values, all of the things that we associate with gender and sex binaries, et, et cetera, they may not actually apply. Um, so when you're translating, it's really important to think about how will you manage that and still make the work legible to, um, to the reader. So that's one thing to think about. And the case of the membranes is an interesting one. Um, I mean, for many reasons, I, I think, but that, that book was, um, well, for one thing, the author is still quite alive and well, so we chat regularly. And um, so when I had questions, I could just ask him directly. Um, but in that case as well, um, there's, yes, as far as I know, I mean, please somebody educate me if there's another um, trans feminine uh, main character in Chinese of the last 50 or 60 years. I mean, there probably is, it's just that I don't know about it. Um, but in the membranes, that's not the main point. It's almost incidental. It's part of the world of the character. And um, and so it would, I think, be uh, dishonest to use that as a marketing point. And yet, uh, for those of us who, for, for many trans people, it's really important to read representation of trans characters. So how do you kind of walk that fine line of, you know, letting people know that, yes, this, this character is a figure here who's, and it's a problematic case as well. It's not a straightforward one um, without making that the point of the book, which it isn't, in my opinion, is not uh, the point. So yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a bit of, it's a bit of a challenge uh, on that score. Um, I have a lot more to say on that, but I don't want to take up all of our time. Thank you. Um, I think we, we're running slightly over now, so I think we'll we'll bring it to a close. Um, but yeah, if any of you have any last kind of advice for those tuning in, or um, if you just want to bid your farewells and let us know maybe what you're working on or what's what's coming your way, um, then we can close there. But thank you so much for all three of you. Um, it's been a pleasure to listen to you, and uh, we've had some great interactions. Uh, from people tuning in as well so that's always lovely to see uh, so yeah on behalf of comma uh, thank you very much and um yeah if you've got any last kind of remarks please do go ahead trans rights are human rights and human rights are trans rights <laughs> sounds good yeah, yeah, um, I couldn't put it any better. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invite and this conversation, I hope, um, continues. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.